And it's just on uh, the link, the Blackboard without voice, you've noticed that <clears throat> I'm starting without those first slides. So usually we would be sitting in, in a lecture room and we've done urinary lab, whatever, two weeks ago or more. And uh, now we're doing it in, in lecture. So there's slides for the unaudio that have a review of the anatomy from lecture. And usually I'll kind of go from the physiology that we did about the nephron as well. Um, but you can review it with your audios that you already have. So I took those out. Um, and now at this point, I bet this is all going to seem repetition because you've, you've done it with lab. Lab test is coming up. You have a lot of this stuff down pat, right? The purpose of the urinary system. We need to control our water amount. We need to control our solute amounts or our electrolytes. Um, drugs, do we need to get rid of um, some drugs that we've had, you know, some penicillin? Do we need to recapture some salt and water because we're dehydrated or our blood pressure is crashing? All those kind of things. Acid base, how are we doing with our hydrogen ions? We have to keep all these at a certain level and the urinary tract is in charge of that. How's our blood count? Did we just donate a pint of blood? Kidneys are gonna put out some erythropoietin to start the production of red blood cells at the red bone marrow. Is your blood pressure messing up? We're gonna release some renin to control the angiotensin conversion to increase blood pressure. Kidneys, even we've talked about how the skin starts the ball, ball running on vitamin D, but it's actually a precursor. That precursor is going to go to the liver, and the liver is going to change it up a little bit, and then it's going to go to the kidney, and then the kidney is going to change it up again. This is where we're going to get our official usable vitamin D3 is from the kidneys. Something I see in here that's not specified out is calcium. Calcium is also something that's going to be regulated at the um, at the kidneys. All right, and that's thanks to parathyroid hormone. What else is in the urinary system besides the kidneys? So easy. The ureter that's taking the urine from the kidney to the bladder and then the urethra that is going to take from the, the urine from the bladder out the body. Let's get rid of all that stuff. Picture with a setup of how everything is. This is a female. Notice how that um, bladder is sitting right on um, underneath the uterus. So baby inside that uterus bouncing around like a trampoline. I say that a lot, don't I? I must have experienced it a few times. It definitely is a trampoline, y'all. Right? If you've had a baby, you know what I'm talking about. This is uh, from a cadaver. So seeing actually how it's setting up in the, in the, um, the body. The male. So there's no uterus to look for on this one. This would be a great picture. Look at vessels too. With the celiac coming out with the three branches off the celiac. Uh, superior mesenteric is cut away. Renal. Isn't that cool? Inferior mesenteric. Good review. So where are those guys? They're actually retroperitoneal. They're right along your back muscles. Um, so to get to it from the from the ventrum, if you're gonna have surgery from the ventrum, they have to cut through your um, belly, cut through the parietal peritoneum, move all those all that stuff away out of the way, then cut through the parietal peritoneum again to get to the kidney. That's very painful. I've mentioned a few times that there's nerves that run through the peritoneum. So sometimes kidney surgery is done from the back, so you don't have to cut through the peritoneum. Adrenal gland sits on top of it, and then it has this concave surface called the hilum where you'll see 
the the ureters coming off of it and the artery in the vein. Of course, there's always a nerve and lymphatic running along with those guys too. The right kidney is actually lower than the left because of the liver lobes. And then we have actually a couple of things. We have a fibrous capsule. So if the kidney gets mad and starts to swell, you'll feel it. You'll feel kidney pain. So for whatever reason, if it's a kidney infection or um, sometimes if the ureter gets kinked off and fluid starts to build up in the renal um, sinus, then it will start to stretch. It'll start to destroy the kidney tissue and you can feel that too. So one thing about kidney disease, sometimes it's silent. It's silent if the cells are just dying from age, you know, not a toxin or anything like that. But if something's going on with your kidney, a lot of times you'll feel that renal capsule start to swell. Um, let's see, uh, fat, there's a fatty cushion. I mentioned this in AMP1. Crash diets and massive um, fat loss is gonna affect this fat too. And so the kidneys will start to droop and that'll kick off, kink off the ureter. That's bad. Oh, I didn't mention the renal fascia. That's kind of like an anchor. Um, keeps keeps the kidney in place. It's trying to keep the kidney in place, but notice what it's surrounded by. Also deep to it is fat. So you lose the fat, then it's still going to droop. So the right kidney, because it hangs lower than the left kidney, because the liver lobes are in the way, it's prone to trauma. So, um car accidents, maybe it's going to crack and bleed. That's a big deal. Um, and then, you know, maybe even if it gets right yanked away, if it's a hard enough hit, it'd have to be a hard hit still. It's not like the renal artery is tiny. Uh, it's not huge. It's not tiny. But of course, if that actually ripped, you could bleed to death pretty darn quick. Hematuria, blood in the urine. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with your kidney. It could be something wrong with the um, bladder. And actually, bladder infections are more common than uh, kidney infections, especially in youth. Okay, we've done this in lab. Outer part, cortex. That's where you're going to find corpuscles. Medullary part is deeper. This is where you're going to find all those loops of Henle. It's divided into pyramids, and at the very tip, the deepest part of the pyramid, you're going to find papilla. It looks like a salt and pepper shaker, and this is where the collecting ducts are dumping out. There's a separation between these pyramids called renal columns, and the columns are actually cortex-type tissue, so you can find corpuscles in this area. Going from the salt, or salt and pepper shakers from the um, papilla, you're going to have a minor calyx, which is going to drain into a major calyx, which empties into the pelvis. All of that collecting system is, is, um, is called the sinus, the renal sinus. So I need to fix that on this slide. I didn't realize that's like that. That's the renal sinus. Pictures. Pyelonephritis. This is when infection actually affects the entire kidney. Um, pylo is actually uh, a Latin derivative for pus. Um, if it gets bad enough, so the tissues aren't just infected, they actually start to pocket, then you get abscesses, so pockets of pus. Um, that can completely destroy the kidney, and you'd have to just remove the kidney. If you catch it in time, and you treat it with antibiotics. Okay, since the kidneys are in charge of cleansing blood, of course, they have a huge blood supply. Um, Mr. Barton likes to throw out numbers like 60 gallons it filters a day or something like that. I can't remember. I won't do that to you. But anyway, suffice it to say, a lot. We've got five liters of blood and it flows through our 
kidneys many, 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 many times a day. How about that? Okay. Um, blood flow starting from that renal artery, which of course is coming off of the um, aorta. Renal artery to segmental artery to interlobar artery, arcuate artery. That's the guy that's kind of arching arc over the renal papilla. And then it breaks into those cortical radiates, so they radiate through the cortex. It's very pretty. And then we're going to become the afferent arterial to the glomerulus, which is a capillary bed. Going to, oh, that's supposed to say e efferent arterial, whatever, you knew that already. Efferent arterial, which is going to go to another capillary bed, which is the peritubular capillaries. And we're going to do all of our exchanges, everything that we need to do along those tubules. So that's where he is, peritubule around the tubules. What do you need? What should I get rid of? What should I keep? Give me that back. Give me that. Take that. Blah, 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 blah. So when all that is said and done, it's pretty deoxygenated. We're going to make our way back. So the peritubular capillary, the venous side, is going to become the cortical radiate veins to arcuate veins to interlobar veins. To the renal veins. So we're going to skip the segmental veins. Um, another thing, what was I going to say? Um, the, what was I going to say? Oh, the left renal vein is about twice as long as the right um, because the inferior vena cava lies um, kind of on the right side. So it's not perfectly midline. Nerve supply, um, sympathetic fibers are going to determine how much urine is being produced uh, by blood flow. So, you know, bears chasing you, it's not a good time to be making urine. Let's just give all of our, the majority of our blood supply to our legs so we can run away from the bear. So the sympathetic nerves are going to um, determine uh, how much blood is flowing the changes that are going to happen. Otherwise, we're under parasympathetic control, right? And we're just doing our own thing. Changes are going to occur, recur because of the sympathetic fibers. Uh-oh. That's not the last slide. Okay. Pictures. I love pictures. Don't you love pictures? Those cortical radiate arteries are pretty, pretty cool looking. Um, something I forgot to mention is that um, in your lab book, instead of being called cortical radiate arteries, they're called interlobular and to me, that's too confusing with the interlobar. Uh -huh. So I like cortical radiate. Plus, it, it, do you see any lobules? I don't see lobules, but I can see how this is radiating into the cortex. So it makes so much more sense anyway. Plus, it's pretty. Um, venous supply return. Remember, there's no segmental veins. Another picture. How many nephrons do we have? This is the functional unit. This is the guy that's doing the work, in other words. The nephrons are the guys that are doing the cleansing of the blood. So we have about a million plus per kidney. And this is why you can donate a kidney and still be fine. Um, because uh, you're not using all 1 million plus, whatever it is, 1.25, 1.35 million, I don't remember. But a lot. You're not using them all at one time. They're um, well, you are, but they're not being taxed, I guess I should say. They're just doing their thing. So um, you also have a lot to spare. So blood values actually will not go up. So BUN and creatinine not being getting rid of, starting to build up in the blood. Um, you won't really notice that until you have greater than 75% loss of nephrons. Not a test question, just a medical thing, which can make it, they've come up with more tests then. So BUN and creatinine aren't the only things that get looked at anymore. Okay. So the main parts, we've got that corpuscle and we have tubules. That's what makes up a nephron. And now we're going to stick to start to get into a lot of stuff that's lab related.
So that glomerulus is a fenestrating capillary. Because of the Swiss cheese hole, it allows things to pool out. That pooling out is going to be called filtrate right now. This is not going to be called um, urine yet. Um, we're kind of cleaning out the fridge. We should not have any protein in there. We should not have cells in there. Nothing big should be in the filtrate. And then we have this capsule around it. Bowman's capsule is how your lab book talks about it. The cup that catches the filtrate. Glomerular capsule is how your lecture book does it. Now here's something new. That Bowman's capsule has two layers, a parietal layer and a visceral layer. Does that sound familiar? I mean, those terms, not on a glomerulus. So the parietal layer is actually the simple squamous that makes up the cup. But along those capillaries, there's these cool cells. They're called podocytes. This is the visceral layer of the capsule, but it's the capsule is physically touching the capillaries. So those capillaries have these spaces, these Swiss cheese holes, but these cells actually make feet that are also creating filtration slits. So the filtrate has to pass through those Swiss cheese holes, the baby Swiss cheese holes. They're not massive, they're little, but they also have to pass between the feet of the um, podocytes. So here's the glomerular capsule layer. That's the outside part of the cup. And then this is showing those podocytes that are touching the glomerulus. And there's always a basement membrane they're actually sharing. We, we don't really get into the basement membrane very often, but um, all tissues have a supportive basement membrane on their epithelium. So where are these guys? The corpuscle is located in the, located in the cortex and the loop, that nephron loop, dips down into the medulla. The distal convoluted tubules are going to be in the cortex too. Um, and those are those simple cuboidal cells that you met in AMP um, 1. Um, So they have three parts. We have the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, so the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. The nephron loop is the loop of Henle. And then the distal convoluted, convoluted tubules are going to drain into the collecting duct. You have many distal convoluted tubules that are going into the collecting duct. So important terminology. We've been through this in lab. Let's do it again. Glomerular filtration. And um, that is a passive process because remember, like just like in lab in AMP1, filtration was passive. The difference is in lab, we were using gravity as the um, driving force and in the body, it's blood pressure. So hydrostatic blood pressure is going to be pushing that filtering. Tubular reabsorption is taking stuff from the tube, reabsorbing it back into the blood. Tubular secretion is when we are, and that can be active or passive, sorry, reabsorption can be passive or active. Tubular secretion is taking things from the blood and pushing it into the filtrate. Oh, I've decided I don't want this. Let's get rid of this. I'm going to push it with active processes, pumping it into the filtrate. Okay. Proximal convoluted tubules, those are those cuboidal cells. They have um, microvilli forming the border. And doesn't that make sense? Because they're so busy. The majority of reabsorption is happening at the proximal convoluted tubule. But they can also secrete. So they have these little, these little microvilli. It's not that the distal convoluted tubules don't have it. You'll see in a second. They just don't have as many. Loop of Henle has this descending loop. That descending loop is permeable to water. And then we have the ascending loop, and that side is permeable to um, permeable to uh, solutes, not water. Um, 
don't worry about the types of tissue as far as that descending limb. You'll notice it gets really thin, and that's because it's simple squamous because there's so much going on down there. Distal convoluted tubule does have microvillum, but just not as much. They're more about secretion, not that it can't reabsorb. Also in the cortex. So you see they don't have as many fuzzy things on their apical side. They do have some, but not as many. So when you look, actually look at these tubules now. Now we've got it all nice and blown up. There's one that's pointed out as the proximal convoluted tubule, and the lumen looks fuzzy. It looks like there's all kinds of stuff in it. That's the microvilli. The tubes that don't have stuff in it, that's distal convoluted tubules because they don't have nearly as many microvilli. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. The glomerulus is that wad of, um, of capillary. And we have the afferent and efferent arterial going in. And then you can see the glomerular capsule simple squamous on the parietal layer. Um, you would not be asked to point out parietal layer and visceral layer on lab test, by the way. Okay, collecting ducts. We've got some very important cells in these collecting ducts. We have the most numerous is the principal cells. So they're going to maintain water and sodium balance. In other words, these are the cells that are going to be acted upon by aldosterone and ADH. These are the cells that if ADH says, hey, don't let that water pass out that urine, I need you to re-catch that. I don't want to diurese, I'm going to anti-diurese. These cells, these principal cells, are the guys whose DNA is going to send out the message to make the protein that is going to be the aquaporin, the integral protein, you can never escape AMP1, that's going to be plugged into the principal cell cell membrane so that he can recapture that water, aquaporins. If you're not doing anything all day long, you just sitting there and drinking some water and drinking some Coke and whatever you're drinking and you're watching some Netflix and, you know, you don't need ADH. You're not doing anything to use that water. Let's get rid of that extra water. So no, no, AD, no um, aquaporins are being placed in there. So the water's just going to pass through. I hope that makes sense. Same thing with aldosterone. It, and we also, I've mentioned in lab, aldosterone also does this, I mean, ADH aldosterone also is going to do this at the um, most distal part of the um, distal convoluted tubules. Okay, and then we have, you've heard intercalated before, intercalated cells. These guys are in charge of acid-base balance. So where we have exchanges of hydrogen ions is going to be in these uh, intercalated cells. They also are loaded with um, microvilli. So again, the collecting ducts are getting many distal convoluted tubules are dumping into it. So you have fewer collecting ducts. You have millions of nephrons. So therefore millions of distal convoluted tubules, but many DCTs can dump into one collecting duct. So they're gonna go through the pyramid. That's what makes that striped look inside the pyramid. And then they're going to empty the filtrate out of the pyramid through the papilla into the minor calyx. Cool pictures. Cool pictures. Okay, we got two ki kinds of nephrons, and I alluded to this in one of our little lectures. Most of them are called cortical nephrons. They do go down into the um, medulla, but their loops aren't very long at all. So the loops are, are um, they get into the medulla, but not nearly as great as the 15%. The 15% juxtamedullary nephrons, their um, corpuscle is actually, it's still in the, it's still in the cortex, but it's deeper. It's going to be closer to the medulla. And these guys are huge in, um, in concentrating urine. So these guys are the guys that are going to kick on when you are exercising. These guys are going to make sure you're going to conserve the most of your water. So therefore, these are going to be the guys that get the most influence from ADH and aldosterone. There's also something else that happens in these guys. 
Okay, so here's a picture showing both the cortical nephrons, the ones that don't go deep, and then the juxtamedullary nephrons. Notice that the corpuscle for the juxtamedullary, he is um, deeper, so closer to the medulla. And then look at that loop of Henle, how long it is. Okay, so I haven't mentioned this very often, but um, now I will because we don't really get to it too much in lab. Um, paratubular capillaries get a fancy name in this one. They're still paratubular capillaries, but they're called vasa recta. Remember, recta means straight, and vasa has to do with blood. So it's not quite this... Um, there's not as much going on with the paratubular capillaries in the cortical nephrons because they're not doing as much of the concentration. They're still filtering. They're still doing 85% of them. We're still just cleaning out the blood. But every now and then, we need to kick in these guys into full force to save as much water as possible. These guys also would be the guys that would be kicking in if you had a sudden drop in blood pressure. Yep. Uh, are y'all tired of this part yet? I've already said this already. Afferent arterioles are the ones that are going into the glomerulus. They're wider. And then, after it goes through the glomerulus, it comes out as a thinner efferent. So because the efferent is thinner, you're decreasing the diameter, so therefore you're increasing the resistance, therefore you're increasing the blood pressure behind the, where it changes um, diameter, and so we're increasing the pressure in the glomerulus. Once we get to paratubular capillaries, the pressures are much better. They're going to empty after they've done going through all around the tubules. They're going to be um, becoming a venule side. So you have a an oxygenated side of a capillary again, just reviewing from vessel. And then after they've done all their exchanges uh, of oxygen carbon dioxide, heading back towards the venous system, there's going to be a deoxygenated side of the capillary. So going into the venule system. Again, the vasa recta, it's coming off of an efferent but he is going, dipping way down the nephron, so he's going to have a different name of Acer recta. Pictures. Pictures. Okay. Here's a little bit of something that we did not, I've alluded to it in lab, but we haven't really talked about it yet. There's something called a juxta glomerular complex. This is where the distal convoluting tubule goes and kisses the glomerulus between the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole. He is going to recognize filtrate amount. How salty are you? How not salty are you? Do you need some salt? How much water is there? Um, what's my blood pressure at? Is that afferent arteriole as it's going into the glomerulus, is it already too high? Do you have systemic high blood pressure? Are you crashing and burning? Do you have no blood pressure? This, this little guy right here is going to uh, regulate a large portion of all of that. So there's some special cells in there, of course, that have to recognize all this stuff is going on. So macula densa is going to be um, the area that has these chemoreceptors that determine how salty your blood is. So, um, you know, if you have too much salt. Then we have some cells called granular cells. And these guys actually are smooth muscle. They're laying, um, they are part of the afferent arteriole, and it, they're, they're kind of larger than most smooth muscle inside of a, an arteriole. They're the guys that are going to sense blood pressure, and the reason they're called Granular cells is because their granules are full of a hormone called renin. So these guys determining blood pressure, if they recognize that your blood pressure is going low, they release renin to make it go back up. I'm going to skip these extra glomerular mesangial cells. Let's look at this cool picture though. Okay, so on the left, 
So you see the afferent arterial coming in, the efferent arterial going out, and there's a circle. That's actually the distal convoluted tubule where it is kissing the uh, glomerulus. Okay. So the macula densa cells are actually right there lining the um, distal convoluted tubule. And those guys, again, are determining solute concentration. And we have those um, granular cells, which are kind of plumped up, smooth muscle of the arteriole. And their guy, they're going to be the guys that recognize how high is the blood pressure before it ever hits the glomerulus. Because we know it's going to go up in the glomerulus. We don't want to blow out the glomerulus. Right? So if it's already pumping really high, you already have high blood pressure. We don't want to blow out all these guys. You're toast if you do. So this guy is making sure that we are always taking care of that glomerulus as best as possible. Um, so we're saving our kidneys. So sometimes you'll hear, you know, what came first? High blood pressure killed the kidneys or did the kidneys kill the blood pressure? Hmm. Don't know. Depends. Okay, so you have a lot of fluid pumping through those kidneys daily, but we actually only make about one and a half liters of urine. So we conserve a whole lot of that water. 99% of that water that passes through there is going to be recaptured. And you already know this, filtrate is essentially plasma without the proteins, without the big stuff, or any synthetic things that we've put into our body, like um, antibiotics or any sort of medicines. In the end, all that filtrate that went in there, remember, if I'm saying 99% of the water gets reabsorbed, then about 1% of that original stuff is actually going to be urinated out. Ah, here's that again, that term, filtration. It should be cell-free and protein-free. Big stuff don't doesn't get to go in there, just the little stuff. And then, even of that little stuff... A lot of it is going to get reabsorbed and put back into the blood. 99% of it. Somewhere in that nephron, we're going to put it back in the blood. 99% of it. That's reabsorption. Sometimes those big things that never made it into the tubular system, that's still floating around the blood, we want to get rid of it. Those synthetic things. Have we used up our antibiotics, broken it down? Now we're done with it? You have to urinate it out. Your kidneys are in charge of getting rid of waste. So anything that you put in your body, it's going to get used, broken down, do its job, and it, or try and kill you like drugs, like bad drugs. If you're not dead, then you're going to take the metabolites and pass them in the urine. Hence, urine tests for drug testing. Cool picture. Summarizing all the... This actually got a lot of information on this. Um, study this. Oh, here we go again with the hydrostatic pressure pushing uh, filtrate through the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. I think we're going to look at the picture. Yeah, we're going to look at up close and personal picture of the glomerulus's filtration system now. Look at how wide that afferent arteriole is compared to the efferent arteriole. And look at those podocytes and how their little feet come together. And they look kind of like a starfish, don't they? They're really cool looking. So the filtrate has to get through the fenestrations, the, Swiss, the baby Swiss cheese holes, and through those slits created by the podocytes. It's all part of the filtration. Then look at that proximal convoluted tubule. They put all those dots to indicate the microvilli. The abundance of microvilli. Why? To increase surface area. The more surface area you have, the more um, integral proteins that you have, which are channels to help you reabsorb things back into the neighboring uh, peritubular capillary. Uh, more pictures. Look at the fenestrations. But then, see, we've got the not just those little baby Swiss cheese holes. Then we have the podocytes and their little feet coming together. 
creating more of a passageway. We just want to make sure that nothing big sneaks out. That's what that's all about. More pictures. More pictures. <laughs> Remember your hydrostatic pressure inside your capillary should push things out. Another thing too is that we have, um, oh, well I said I wasn't going to talk about those um, mesangial cells, but anyway, I guess we will. Those guys are kind of like um, macrophages. So how do we come up with the fact that we're having a pushing force that creates filtration where you're going to have outward pressures and you're going to have inward pressures. These outward pressures are the ones that are going to promote filtration formation. So the pushing of um, your overall blood pressure inside the capillary, that hydrostatic pressure. You also have, um, and that's the major one. So I'll just stop there. You also have um, inward pressures that are trying to pre inhibit filtration. So that's why it's not going to be just that straight 55 millimeters of mercury based on the efferent being um, smaller in diameter. You're also going to have these other things that are trying to combat filtration. So inside the actual capillary, you're going to have the sucking from proteins. So always having that osmosis trying to pull water into the capillary. And then the capsule itself, the um, filtrate that's already inside um, the, the, that's already inside of the um, capsule, that's going to be producing pressure too, or you're filling up the capsule with stuff. So in the end, you have to figure out the difference between the two to get the number. So on this one, we've got the hydrostatic pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury, but oh yeah, we've got some proteins in there. So that's making a play. And then we also have the hydrostatic pressure from the, how much are you pushing into that capsule? So that's gonna be an opposing force to the filtration. Okay, again, this, this slide probably has too much information on it too, but I, I wanna leave in glomerular filtration rate because GFR, is something that they will use at doctor's offices to determine um, to determine uh, your kidney health. Um, let's see, anything else I want to say in there? No. Okay. What controls glomerular filtration rate? Well, we have a lot of stuff. We've mentioned these intrinsic controls that help keep us in homeostasis before. Their job is with minor changes every day. Did you go to Jack in the Box? Did you get a whole bunch of salty fries? Your kidneys are going to be changing that kind of stuff all the time to maintain your filtration rate of that glomerulus in your kidneys so that we don't have wide changes in our uh, kidney. We don't want to blow out the glomerulus. So we have these little changes inside the kidneys that help um, with the safety of our kidneys. And then of course we have GFR is affecting um, systemic blood pressure. So with if you have an increase in GFR, you're going to put out more urine, which if you're putting out more urine, then you're losing water. So if you have less water in your blood, then you have a lower blood volume, which is going to lower your blood pressure. Um, extrinsic controls is going to be your nervous system and your endocrine system. So, you know, your brain's always going to win. Brain, brain is a huge player. And um, under normal influences, your brain actually get message, gets messages as well and helps control your blood pressure. Um, by recognizing, okay, Al likes salt. My blood pressure are low. Maybe I'm going to go ahead and tell my adrenal gland to put out some more salt, uh, aldosterone, so I can recapture some of that salt because water follows salt. So I'm going to increase my blood pressure. Uh, 
by um, telling my adrenal gland, hey, get busy. Let's release some aldosterone so I can save some salt, so I can save some water, so I can increase my blood pressure. Uh, again, maybe a little bit too much information, but we have these intrinsic controls where your kidneys are in charge of keeping that GFR constant as long as your blood pressure is staying constant. So these little things can actually help regulate your blood pressure. Um, they can be based on constriction of muscle, smooth muscle, or it can have to do with um, your body recognizing how salty something is. So myogenic, that goes back to those granular cells that are going to recognize the blood pressure at the afferent arterial. So if blood pressure is too high, those granular cells are going to contract so that we have less pounding of the glomerulus. We want to maintain the blood pressure inside the glomerulus. If the systemic blood pressure is too low, those granular cells are going to dilate and let more blood flow to the kidneys because if your kidneys don't get good blood flow, the kidney's going to die. So all about protecting the kidneys. And then this is the, the tubuloglomerular feedback is where that distal convoluted tubule comes back and kisses the area of the glomerulus between the afferent arter and efferent arterioles. They have those macula densa cells that recognize a solute concentration. So um, if, if uh, the filtrate is getting a little bit too salty, then he can tell the afferent arterial to constrict. So decrease the glomerular filtration rate. You're getting too salty. Slow down. Let's, let's get some of that salt back in the blood. Okay, and then we've got brain and hormone. So um, if, if blood, this is going to be uh, if things get really drastic. So we're going to have a rapid uh, drop in blood pressure, then we're going to kick in neural controls and um, hormonal controls. So at normal, our kidney, value, our kidney vessels are dilated and the intrinsic controls are working good, changing a little bit depending on what you're doing. Are you exercising? Are you watching Netflix? Uh, are you sitting? Did you stand up suddenly? All these kind of things. This is intrinsic control and um, going to be both myogenic and tubuloglomerular and um, life's good. But here we go. Crashing and burning. Car accident. You're dumping all this blood into your belly or on the concrete or whatever. Then we're going to have to kick into um, an intr extrinsic control to so try to save your life. The main way is renin stimulating angiotensinogen to become eventually angiotensin 1, then angiotensin 2, which is going to tell aldosterone to be released to increase salt, to increase water. Put more water in the blood because water followed salt, then, or sodium, I should say perfectly, sodium. If you put more water in the um in the blood, you're increasing the volume of the blood, and then therefore you're increasing your blood pressure. This summary right here is all about um, just intrinsic control and extrinsic control. So are we just taking care of the kidneys, making sure that life is good? We've got these little changes each and every day. And that's going to be intrinsic control at the juxtaglomerular apparatus or juxtaglomerular, I can't remember what your book calls it, but that's how I learned about it, juxtaglomerular apparatus. So those different changes, making sure that we're not blowing out the glomerulus. So we're taking care of, we are taking care of the kidneys despite changes in 
food intake, um, despite changes in exercises, despite changes even in positions, little strains on our life, We're taking care of our kidneys every day. And this is as a normal, okay? Extrinsic control has to do more with maintaining systemic blood pressure and taking care of us, especially if we get way too far out of range. So these would be abnormals. Extrinsic controls are gonna kick in if we start having abnormals. Okay, so imbalances. Um, if you have a very minimal amount of urine coming out, that's called anuria, and this is bad. Um, now, it doesn't mean it can't be fixed because you could be in anuria because your kidneys just aren't working anymore, which means that you have a very short period of time, hours left to live, you know, maybe 24, 48, 72, but um, it won't take long before you're gone. Now, toxins or other sort of things like um, toxemia from pregnancy, which is... Um, not from a poison itself. It's actually has to, it's an abnormal um, elevation in blood pressure and it starts shutting down your kidneys and your liver. Um, but anyway, these things are treatable. But for whatever reason, your nephrons just decide to not work anymore. So that term anuria is bolded because it could be a fill-in-the-blank question. 